we're going to focus our attention on what it means to trust God's purpose. How many of you know that God has a purpose for your life? Is that all right? And now, all you didn't say anything, you're making me worry about you a little bit. I'm going to ask that question again because maybe, maybe some of you don't know God has a purpose for your life, but I'm here to remind somebody or tell somebody that God has a purpose for your life. And he wants to use you. And he wants to bless you. Thank you, Antoine. And he is wanting to do great things through you. And what we're going to do is take a look at a passage of scripture, and we're going to not just have this as a primary text, the, the, the one we'll find in Jeremiah, but we'll go to a few passages, and I hope at the end of our time together that you'll be reminded or encouraged of just how God wants you to connect with him in order to bring glory to his name. Not, not your name, but to his name. We're going to take a look at Jeremiah chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn to that passage. This is where we find God challenging Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told not to marry, and, and he was to have a very interesting social life. He was to speak his word, and Jeremiah was to remind Judah of their sin. And he was to remind them that, that they had relied on foreigners and placed their alliances with people who did not trust God. And because of their persistent refusal to obey God, God will now punish them for not being obedient. And, and what we're going to get out of this is the heart of the issue. Is that anyone who does not have a heart that communes with God is not considered one to be with God, but it's labeled as wicked and deceitful. Anyone who does not choose to embrace the living God invites upon themselves God's judgment. What does that mean? That, that, that means that when we refuse the living God, when we refuse his purpose for our lives, we're no longer working with God, but working against God. We're, we're no longer saying, God, I trust you, but we're telling God, I'm going to do my own thing. Let's take a look at this passage. Jeremiah chapter 17, 5 through 8 says, this is what the Lord says, bad things will happen to those who put their trust in people. Bad things will happen to those who depend on human strength. That is because they have stopped trusting who? The Lord. They are like a bush in a desert where no one lives. It is in a hot and dry land. It is in bad soil. The bush does not know about the good things that God can give. But those who trust in the Lord will be blessed. They know what the Lord will do, what he says. They will be strong like trees planted near a stream that sends out roots to the water. They have nothing to fear when the days get hot. Their leaves are always green. They never worry, even in a year that has no rain. They always produce fruit. You see, what we get out of here is that a person is blessed when they understand God's will, when they understand God's purpose for their life. That anyone who depends upon the strength of themselves or the strength of others does not know what it means to walk with God. Does not know what it means to be blessed by God. I want to go to our 
first point, but I want to be reminded of this one verse here. But those who trust in the Lord will be blessed. They know that the Lord will do what he says. Here's a point I want us to recognize. Is that when we trust in God, he is able to do good things through you. I want to give you an example. You know, many of us are here for maybe many different reasons. I hope that those reasons have everything to do with God and, and, and where you're going in life. And you know, I'm, I'm always reminded, every time I see any activity that is related to the inner city ministry or the inner city church, I'm just reminded of how this whole thing began. Now, I don't know, some of you may not have been around in around 1979. You know, I'm still amazed that some of our young people, all that they have known has been inner city. They haven't lived at a time where there was not an inner city. But some of you, I don't want to call you old, but some of you older people, know when we didn't have buses, when we were just, what, a concept. But way back then, 1979, there was already a group of people just simply trusting the Lord, believing that they could be used by God. And today, they are recognizing the fruit of their labor in Christ. You see, a few people understood that a bus is not just a bus. But some people understood that the bus was a unique tool for God Almighty. That that bus could be used to glorify his name. And we're dealing with the fruit of that righteous labor. You know, yes, or rather last week was an interesting point in my life, and I just want to kind of review that again, because at the end of service, I didn't lose my mind, but I almost did. You know, last week was interesting because I saw something that I believe will carry on to my last days on this earth, where I saw a large group of, of teenagers uh, uh, walking out of the, uh, of the church building. And I realized, that, you know, maybe that's all that they knew to do. And I want you to know that I'm not discouraged, but I'm profoundly encouraged. I want to tell you why today I'm encouraged. Because I believe that I'm not the only one who's trusting God today. I believe I'm not the only one who believe in the good things God's going to do. But I'm also realizing that we all have to put our trust in God if we're going to see what God can truly do. He's already done great things, but I believe in a God who wants to do greater things in this church. That's the type of God I serve. That's the type of God that you serve. Last week, when I recognized all of those teenagers just, just, just kind of going the opposite direction than those who were coming for prayers, I felt the need to encourage some of you to go back there and, and and talk to them and, 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 and recognize or try to discover who is the king of their lives. Now, I wasn't discouraged, but let me tell you something. I'm here to tell you, church, that the inner city ministry is doing its part. The inner city ministry is doing its part. And it's time, hear me out. For those of us who are part of the inner city church of Christ to do its part. Now, how do I know that? All of those young people got here some way. I know they didn't walk. Help me, Jesus. They got here some way, somehow. That was a good thing. They got here. Let me tell you another good thing. They were here. And thank you, Jesus, they were not brawling. You know the only thing left for those kids? You know the only thing left for those teenagers? 
is development. Let me ask you a question. When I get too old, who's going to take my spot? When you get too old, and don't act like you're not going to get too old, who's going to take your spot? Who's going to help build this congregation? I want y'all to be reminded that those young people who walked out last week, they're our future. Somebody asked me, I got a problem with this church, even though they're a member of this church. I got a problem with this church. And they said, I just don't like that these young people, especially these teenagers, come without their parents. And I simply said, amen, amen, sister. But they could have stayed at home. Do God really want them to stay at home? Now, some would say, yes, in Jesus' name. But I'm of the opinion that there's a reason why they don't come here with their parents. There's a reason. And I think we're the reason. And I think God has given us all the opportunity that we could ever ask for. Because this is a very interesting church, a unique church. In that same week, church, when I asked you to go back and kind of help, help, help remedy a, a, a pressing issue, Wednesday night, I want to say that among those same young people, I had the deepest theological discussion I've had ever at the inner city church of Christ from those same young people. Church, that tells me that we probably have unlimited growth inside this building. But we all are going to have to trust in God. Don't trust in just what you see. But be obedient to the one who is placing you in a unique position. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in everything God works for the good of those who love him. These are the people God chose because that was his plan. I want to talk about this a little bit. Point number two is this, family. He called you. And because he called you, now you call on him. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I want to ask the question, why are you here today? I, I pray that you're here because you want to worship the Lord God. But you know what I know about this church? And what I know about the ministry that we're married to is that it takes a calling to roll up in this church. Because this is not your traditional church. And this is not your grandmama's church. Because we call ourselves the inner city church of Christ. And that name alone is enough of a boo factor to run half to Nashville away. But I strongly believe, family, that there is a calling inside this building. There's a calling that speaks to the heart of everyone that is here, and that is God is alive. Now, I don't know where you've been. I only can tell you how I ended up here. You see, I came here as a young adult, a married young man looking to serve the Lord. I came upon this congregation that I was asked just to look into and see if I could do something. I walked in a middle school, and I hit, I'm here to tell you it was hot. I started sweating immediately. And in that church, I saw things I'd never seen before because I didn't grow up in church. What I saw was a lot of people in wheelchairs. I saw a mixed congregation. I couldn't call it a black church because too many white people were up in there. Couldn't call it a white church. But what I could call it was 
That's a church that has a whole lot of love inside of it. And I took note of that. I recognized all of those buses, and I recognized how all of those people were able to get there, and they were known as a family. And on that first day, there was a woman who jerked my necktie, Sister Taylor. Anybody remember Sister Taylor? Sister Taylor grabbed my necktie, didn't know me from the other man in the room. She gave me the wettest kiss I ever had on my cheek. And I said to myself, boy, you home. <laughs> There's a calling. I don't know about you, but I want to be a servant of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying other churches are wrong. I'm just saying I didn't fit in other churches. I didn't fit there. But I praise God that I fit right here. I praise God that you fit right here. And I want you to understand that there is a plan that God has for this church. And I want us to achieve that plan. And it's going to require all of us being equipped, not some of us. But it's going to require all of us getting in the game. Now, I know all may not be called to be teachers, but you're called to love. Every, it, it doesn't take a degree to love somebody. You don't have to read to love somebody. You don't have to walk to love somebody. You don't have to see to love somebody. Love is something that we all can do, and that's one of the things that I love about this congregation, that it doesn't matter how many times you stumble. I know for a fact that this church will love you enough where you'll get up. We're not as concerned as to where you have been, but we're concerned about where you're going. This is a church that I firmly believe that can teach the children of a prostitute and teach the children of a surgeon. That's the type of church that maybe other people don't fit in, but I tell you what, this bald-headed man fits in in a church like that. There's a calling. I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm just saying it's for people like you and me. I wonder what people say about us. I wonder what they say about this church's personality. I pray that it's good, but I've gotten so old and fat, I really don't care if it's bad. Because I know what we're about. And I know what we're going to do. And I know I'm going to do everything to make sure that those buses keep on rolling. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we keep on loving. I'm going to do everything that I can to just make sure that we keep on glorifying the Lord together and not apart. Last point. Psalm 40, 2 through 4 says, He lifted me out of the grave. He lifted me from the muddy place. He picked me up, put me on solid ground, and kept my feet from slipping. Here's the point. God lifts you for his purpose. God lifts you for his purpose. Now, we just read verse 2. The explanation of this point is found in verse 3 and 4. Listen. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see what he did and worship him. They will put their trust in the Lord. Great blessings belong to those who trust in the Lord. For those who do not turn to demons and false gods for help. Now as we begin to wrap up, I love this passage because it helps me to remember that only God can put a new song in your mouth. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. For what reason? That other will be able to see how good God has been. It says many will see 
But can I ask you a few questions? Do you really think they will see what the Lord has done for you if they never come to worship? Remember I said the inner city ministry is doing its part. There's something still very special about coming to worship where every young person and older person need to see. Let me tell you something. They may not necessarily see the God that you see during the experience of worship. Let me tell you where the power comes from. They will never ever be able to see the goodness of God until they get to know you. Until they, listen, now I don't want to be offensive, but people can come to church until, they, until the day they die and still miss out on heaven. Y'all ain't hearing me. You can have 100% in attendance and break hell wide open. Somebody hear me? Your attendance doesn't make you holy. Your obedience makes you holy. Your commitment makes you holy. Your fruit makes you holy. Your praise, not just the song, makes you holy. Why do you think God places a praise in their mouth? It's because of your obedience to him. What you have experienced through him. And when you have experienced the goodness of God, then you're able to tell somebody about somebody who saved somebody like you. When you're able to look into the eyes of a teenager who's on the brink of destroying their life, when you're able to look at them and tell them, hold on, it's going to be all right. God has not forsaken you. I have not forsaken you. Hold on. God is faithful. Hold on. Keep on praying. Hold on. Pick up your Bible, baby. Hold on. Keep on loving people. Hold on. Don't give up. You see, when you've been through some things, no longer will you say, you know what? I can't deal with those people. Because I'm here to tell you, God made you to deal with some rough people. God made you to proclaim his name. God made you for his purpose. And what is going to be great about the church that we're a part of, that he is not finished with us yet, baby. He's not finished molding us into what he wants us to be. Do you think they will ever worship God if they don't develop a relationship with you? With you? With you? Why do you think God wants them here? So they might see you. They're not here to see me. Let me tell you something. Preaching is a good thing. But your practice is more powerful. Preaching is a good thing. But what we practice and what I practice is the more important thing. You see, when it comes to changing this world, when it comes to changing this city, it's going to always boil down to what we practice and not what the preacher just says. We can't be dependent upon the preacher. But we got to be dependent upon God. I want to close out with this. That God lifts you for his purpose. There, you know, in glory, there is no room for selfishness in glory. Which means there's no room for selfishness in his church. Listen, when we get to glory, when we breathe our last breath, when we've given it all to the Lord, I'm here to tell you, I don't know about you, but I can speak on behalf of myself. 
that when I get to glory and I see the one who created me, I'm not going to say I wished I had more money to pay more bills. Help me, somebody. When I see the one who created me in my mama's womb, I'm not going to say I wish I had more money to pay one more mortgage. No, no. When I see him, I'm not going to say I wish I had a little more money that I could have bought some more clothes. No, I'm not going to say that. How about if I could have bought a better car? No, no. I'm not going to say I wish I had more money so I would have bought something bigger, something more shiny. Maybe you're out there and say, you know, when I see him, huh, I'm going to say, you know what, I wish I would have met another woman. I, I wish I would have met another man. I, I, I wish I wouldn't have had that child. I don't know. But when I see the one who made it all possible, I'm not going to wish for anything. I'm simply going to say thank you. I'm simply going to say thank you for all that you gave me. Thank you for the little bit of clothes I had. Thank you for that raggedy piece of thing I called a house. Thank you for that thing that I called a car. Thank you, Jesus, that you allowed me to serve. Thank you, Jesus, that you allowed me to have the ability to tell somebody about the goodness of your grace, the goodness of your love, how you're long-suffering when I didn't do right. You stayed in there with me, Lord. When I didn't know right, you brought people in my life. When I didn't want to just do anything, people came and visited me. When I was confused, people didn't give up on me. When I see them, when I see them, when I see them, I'll just say, Thank you. It's not because I wanted anything more out of the Lord. None of us should want anything more out of the Lord. How can you get more out of the death of his son? I ask you. God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for me. I'm thankful we're together. I'm thankful God has made big plans for us. May we all be faithful. May we all put ourselves in a position to be equipped to better serve the Lord. If you're not a Christian, how about becoming one today? Why don't you just say yes to the Lord? Be obedient to the gospel today. Are you ready to repent of your sins? Are you ready to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you ready to be baptized into Christ today? Don't forget, today is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow, but you have today. You're not promised you're going to make